In my previous world building video, I discussed an outline for one of my avian human races, Quelian, and their biology, genetics, and a bit of their lifestyle. Now I want to go deeper on their biology, particularly in regards to their wings. Quelian are underestimated by most of the other alien humanoids and even the other avian races in my world. While Quelian see themselves as very dignified, their short stature and round facial features lead outsiders to find them more endearing than a source of serious threat. But, Quelian hearts beat a little faster than ours. Their blood runs a little hotter. An ancient magic inhabits every cell in their bodies, woven through their genetic structure and granting them the gift of flight. Quelian bones are lightweight and honeycombed. They have nimble toes and long, curled toenails, great for gripping the earth during takeoffs and landings. They have two extra vertebrae in their necks, and a keel protrudes a few inches from their sternum. It's quite noticeable in children, but becomes less so as they grow and build muscle. Their muscles are dense, but they have a very low percentage of body fat. They have bird-like air sacs fixed to their lungs. This increases their airflow and helps the oxygenation levels in their bloodstream to keep up with their rapid heartbeat when they fly. All of this aids their flight, but it's not enough. There is a magical element, a spirituality to their flight ability, though it's beyond ancient and none quite remember or understand it. Quillian have an interesting relationship with their wings. It doesn't translate well to any human experience, but they do not think of their wings as simply another set of limbs the same as arms or legs. This might be because of the foreign nature of their wings. Unlike a lot of other races with more subtly integrated genetic source material, Quillian are extremely humanoid, apart from their wings. Two very divergent structures supported by magic. But unlike the other races, with magic running more evenly through their bodies, the magic is focused and centered the magic is focused and centered within Aquilian's wings. So it might not be the wings themselves, but the living magic within their wings that Quillian spiritually bond with. Maybe I can describe the relationship through a comparison. Throughout the history of Earth, different cultures have believed the soul resided in different parts of their body. Some believe that the soul is centered in your heart, some in your brain, and some in your stomach. As discussed previously, most of my mainland cultures believe that the soul resides within the skull. But if you were to ask, Little rooster. But if you were to ask avians where their soul resides, Quillian would undoubtedly unhesitatingly answer with their wings. And if you observe them carefully, you might begin to understand why they believe this. Their wings display an unusual level of independence for a mere body part. They have their own emotions. They might quiver with fear or flare up with aggression or urge their owners to take to the skies upon feeling a particularly tempting gust of wind ruffle their feathers. Many Quillian can recount a flight or two when their wings snapped and swerved independently, narrowly saving them from an unforeseen danger. Or they've watched their own wing reach out and drape itself over the shoulder of a mourning loved one, seemingly of its own volition. Whatever the truth may be, it is universally acknowledged that to lose a wing is nothing at all like losing an arm or a leg. Aside from the practical matters, losing the ability to fly and participate in their culture, Quillian who lose their wings experience emotional distress more akin to losing a twin. They feel as though their very soul has been ripped away, and they often don't recover. Even when they grow old and no longer have the strength to fly, Quillian cherish their wings. They will fondly remember the best flights and hunts and dances, carefully preening and oiling their wings in an expression of gratitude. As they age, the advantages of Quillian's bodies begin to show counterpoints. Their lightweight bones become brittle, and they are particularly prone to breaks, even from the impact of a hard landing. Flying becomes a struggle, and later an impossibility. Muscle insulates to an extent, and helps keep flyers warm in the winter, but the elderly who've begun to lose their flight muscles have a hard time maintaining their body heat. Because of the energy used in flight, Quillian have an extremely fast metabolism and require a high protein diet with two to three times as many calories as a human needs. The fattier and richer the meat, the better. They will also eat eggs, nuts, fish, and many types of insect if game becomes scarce. But meat is absolutely essential to stay healthy. And so, of course, hunting to provide meat for your flock is the most valued and glorified position one can have. Quillian fledglings will gradually lose their down and grow their first set of feathers. But after that, they will continue to molt feathers regularly, with a heavier molt during the early spring and autumn. Molted feathers are usually kept. Some are used for arrow fletching. Strong, stripped-down quills have multiple practical uses, such as weaving baskets and lattices, or for structuring garments. Soft child's down is an excellent source of insulation during the winter. Long, primary feathers are often given away as a sign of respect. Many families have a large collection of their forefathers' primaries. Now, feathers from the underside of your wings, on the other hand, are a much more intimate gift to give. 
Aquilian skin where their wings attach is very sensitive, especially right under the wings. Large oil glands are settled at the base of the wings, and preening is important for wing health. Preening consists of cleansing the wings with water, sand, or dry dust, then oiling the feathers by stroking the wings from the base out, pulling down the oil released by the glands, much like how brushing your hair pulls down the oil from your scalp. It is normal to preen your own wings, but having someone do it for you is also nice, as they can see spots you might otherwise miss. Like with most physical touch, there is a level of intimacy with preening someone's wings, so it is usually kept between couples, siblings, close friends, or parents taking care of their children. You wouldn't take kindly to a stranger preening your child. Quillian backs in general, but particularly under their wings, are a cultural taboo. Similar to preening someone's wings, scratching their back provides comfort and calm and peace. It requires physical vulnerability, and when that vulnerability is positively repaid, it helps to build trust and bonding. Therefore, you would want to be careful about who exactly you let close to you in that manner, and make sure that they're worthy of that trust. While naive children might not understand the taboo, an adult would know better than to ever reach under someone else's wings without consent. Aside from the physicality, another reason Quillian see preening as a very personal thing is because of the oil itself. The oil has a strong scent, called musk. Every individual has a slightly different musk, and different flavors have meaning. Avians can smell each other's excitement, fear, desire, or even depression through the subtle scents in their musk. They can learn a lot about somebody just by smelling them, which for the Quillian leads to a fairly open, trusting culture. But it also contributes to their distrust of outsiders, especially the strange, wingless people without any definable scent. Do those people even have feelings? If they don't have wings, can they have souls? Those poor flightless people. Outsiders, for their part, can smell the musk but can't interpret it. Their noses aren't attuned to the sensitivity required. So they generally think of musk as just a strong body odor, and wonder how the avians live in such a cloud of stink. Maybe avians are just used to it, those poor people. Maybe we should introduce them to deodorant or perfume. Quillian also have a dual vocal system. They have a larynx situated near the top of their trachea, but they also have a syrinx at the base. This allows them to produce normal human vocalizations, but also a wide range of bird calls. A code has developed, a language of flight signals, or short, sharp, incredibly loud bird calls that allow flying Quillian to communicate with each other over great distances and the deafening noise of the wind. In addition to flight signaling, there is also bird song, a language of vocalizations utilizing softer bird calls such as warbles and coos and trills and chirps. The musical quality of this language lends itself well to performance. Birdsong is not usually spoken in casual conversation, but it is used for the Quillian equivalent of poetry and song and epic storytelling. Few outsiders have ever learned to understand this language, and none without a syrinx can learn to speak it. Outsiders who have heard it describe it as incredibly beautiful. Or incredibly annoying. I guess it depends on the song. It is usually the elderly too old to hunt who spend their time learning and passing on epic bird songs. Boys might learn a few romantic songs when they reach wooing age. A mother might coo a nursery song to her children at night. Certain bird songs are ceremonious, such as when burying a fallen hunter, or marking a new yinente, or witnessing a sacred vow. Others are more mundane, such as rhythmic working songs. Some are saved for festivals and dances, but we'll get into that another time. <sighs> okay, so I'm sure you noticed that this video is new content. I do technically have one old video left to re-upload, but I'll get back to it when I feel like it. I think I figured out the format I want to use with future videos. The primary content will be shorter than it was in my old videos, aiming for about 8 minutes so that the art and editing don't become overwhelming. I think this length is also better for going deeper on one narrow topic rather than broad like I did before. Then I do want to keep going through the comments regularly. I started because I was going to be taking down the old videos and I wanted to preserve and answer some of the comments. But one, it's fun. Two, the comments are genuinely helpful to me. And three, that kind of back and forth engagement really tickles the algorithm. <laughs> So what if we do a bit of comment discussion as a second half? This should bring each video to a modest 15 minutes average length, unlike the 25-ish minutes they've been so far. <laughs> One note, this is the last video in which I'll be censoring the names of commenters, so fair warning. Triangular body type then proceeds to draw a woman with hella thick hips the same width as her shoulders. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, okay, look, just because I say a thing doesn't mean I can draw the thing. I'm working on it. I'll replace her at some point with a more accurate depiction, okie dokie. <laughs> okay, this comment was pointing out that 5'7 for an adult male is actually not that short. It led me down a small rabbit hole wherein I discovered that my assumption of 5'10 being the general average male height actually isn't true for most of the world. With that in mind, I might change the Quillian height later. Can I borrow your ideas? 
I get asked this question a lot and I honestly do not care. I basically made my peace with the fact that people will use my ideas before I started making world building videos. To me, the input I receive outweighs the drawbacks, but you should obviously change the ideas enough to make them somewhat original before implementing them. If you do just directly copy and paste my stuff, I won't be mad. I'm just going to assume that you are a child or an extremely uncreative adult and therefore probably not someone I should feel threatened by. This comment suggested using an atlatl, at, at, atlatl, 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 sounds more right, probably. Atlatl. This comment suggested using an atlatl, atlatl for hunting. After looking that up, yes. So far I've written the Quillian as using bows and arrows or spears, but the spears seemed like a bit of a problem because they're just too long to conveniently carry while flying. I like this atlatl idea because it looks like it could be used with really big arrows, which is awesome. The way I've written it so far, there is a bit of a divide between who uses spears and who uses bows. Bows are older and more traditional and require a high level of skill to aim while mid-flight. Spears are newer and seen as less elegant, but easier to learn and probably more practical. So it says something about a family or flock or individual which they prefer as their weapon of choice. I think replacing spears with an atlatl would be an even more effective way to communicate this. Both bows and atlatls are ancient weaponry, but it matters that few people have heard of an atlatl, at least compared to people who know what bows and arrows are. So even if it isn't actually new technology, it might be new to the audience, which helps to reinforce the illusion of it being some newfangled contraption that all the kids are hunting with these days. This comment is asking if it would be more common to hear males playing music or singing in this culture. Yes, I think that the males, especially teenagers, are just a little bit more showy in general. Cocky, performative, dramatic, attention whores you might say. If we're allowed to say that on the internet nowadays, I'm not sure. <laughs> not that they're really that bad, but it's a common enough personality trait to become a stereotype. Maybe the males make their headdresses themselves, so having massive flashy headdresses with lots of bones signals good hunting skills. I like this. I haven't actually thought much about the headdresses other than just imagining them as being big and eclectic, but ancient cultures relied heavily on symbolism, so someday I'll have to have a good think and hone down what different elements might mean symbolically. Sort of like old Victorian flower meanings when men put together a bouquet basically as a secret message. Some people have been talking about how they would need tails in order to fly, but I'm not sure they actually would. If they hold their legs straight back behind them in flight, their legs could be the rudders. See, that's what I thought. <laughs> I might give some of the subspecies tails, but the quillian at least need to be close on the human side of the spectrum. I know legs aren't the same as tail feathers, but they are longer and they weigh more. So I feel like they would do a decent job helping you stay straight or maneuver if you simply angled them and shifted your weight around. An idea for your hunting members of this race is to have their own feathers as the arrow fletching, so it can be identified and nobody can take credit for the kill that wasn't their own. Okay, I used this, but differently, more sentimentally. I have mentioned that one particular couple traded feathers from the undersides of their wings to fletch their arrows. It's aw, how sweet, but your idea is a more practical, mainstream application, and I'm sure they'd do that too. Simply being able to identify your arrows when you go to collect them, and knowing who gets to take credit for the kill. Yeah, yeah, valuable. <laughs> Next. Over on Discord, there was a conversation slash debate that took an interesting turn. It was long with a lot of irrelevant stuff, so I'll try and sum it up. It started with the question of if it would be possible for Aquilian to be born with wings each a different color. Some people were comparing it to heterochromia, but I was really not aesthetically into this idea. Probably mostly because it reminded me of Cruella in the live action movie and how she's just born with perfectly split hair like that. Thank you, Michaela, for making me watch that movie. <laughs> I just don't think it would naturally happen. And if it was like heterochromia, even a lot of people with heterochromia don't have a perfectly even split of colors. They have a splotchy mix of colors. And if that happened with Quillian, I think it would be classified as a speckled coloration, just with the speckling a bit uneven between the two sides. However, someone made a comment that got me thinking about how a person with two wing colors might be seen as untrustworthy or two-faced. I love that. Even if there was no actual person born with a split coloration, I can see it as an idea permeating the culture. Maybe originally as a character. Probably not a god, but maybe a spirit or a mythological figure with some attached story. But then maybe split wings becomes a general symbol for someone who is indecisive or unreliable. And maybe that mythological figure's name becomes synonymous with a traitor or a betrayer. 
Maybe betrayal was what the original story was about, and the goddess cursed him with split wing colors to mark him as untrustworthy. I don't know, the Greek myth vibes are just screaming at me. Wouldn't that make a great prompt for a short story? Write a myth about a character. The goddess of flight, Shikoba, blessed the character and he was born with speckled wings. He did something to betray her. Shikoba turns the blessing into a curse and pulls the speckling apart like oil and water, each half settling on one side of his body. The character is forever marked as untrustworthy and cast out. He wanders the plains, but no flock will take him in. Eventually he dies alone, and his spirit is said to still drift over the plains, sometimes settling on an unfortunate soul. At best, goading them into dishonesty, and at worst, possessing them and fighting for control, driving them mad. So many possibilities. Okay, last one. There were a lot of comments about their clothes and how much wind drag fringe would cause flying. You are absolutely correct, but I'm not changing it. I think that people who don't care about fashion sometimes fall into the belief that fashion evolves along the lines of practical function alone. This is not true. In fact, rarely is fashion only about practicality. Fashion is art. It's political, it's nostalgia, and homage, and symbolism, and personality. It's expression. So yes, fringe is a terrible choice for flying people to wear, but I think Quillian wear it anyways. And if they met a group of avians who wore fitted, streamlined jumpsuits, I think the jumpsuit avians would mock them for wearing such impractical clothing that slows them down. And the Quillian would say, F you, ugly. <laughs> To me, that is the essence of realism in world building. Realistic cultures aren't perfectly functional because real cultures aren't designed by some algorithm for success. Evolution takes all sorts of unpredictable twists, but cultures do have a personality. I think Quillian wear fringe because they love seeing it dance in the wind, but how much they are willing to sacrifice for it would vary. Maybe young hunters in the height of their foolish showy phase would wear the most fringe, and older hunters wear considerably less. And it would vary by individual personality too. <clears throat> well. I don't know if this one is going to make the 15 minute mark. Sorry, there were just too many good things to talk about. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of my work, you can subscribe to me here on YouTube and follow my Instagram. There is a Discord server, but I'm limiting access to controlled growth, so check the description box. And I also have my main YouTube channel for sewing and another Instagram for that. So see you in a couple of weeks, probably.